Good morning, everyone. We're delighted this Sunday to embark on our sermon series on the book of Philippians. We're glad to have you with us. Let us pray and we'll begin. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask for your grace that we might behold the glory of the risen Christ and hear the call of the gospel in our text today. We ask for your Holy Spirit to teach us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Making partner. For most lawyers, accountants, and investment bankers, that's the dream. Making partner. Becoming a partner. For the dream of making partner, people work tirelessly, they sacrifice willingly, they invest themselves tremendously. 14-hour workdays, bring it on. I have to take an overseas assignment and postpone my wedding plans? Acceptable. I will have to miss my children's birthdays every now and again? Okay, can. Why? Because the rewards are great. The rewards outweigh the sacrifices made. The prize is worth the investment. At the end of this stony path, a pot of gold awaits. At the end of the road, there is joy to be had. Making partner is the dream. Another thing about partners, partners aren't merely involved, they are invested. They don't merely congregate, they contribute. Partners are partners because they bring something significant to the table, they each play their part, they bring something tangible to grow the vision of the partnership. So, you buy a Man U jersey and you're a Man U supporter. But if you give enough to get your logo on the jersey, you're a partner. Chevrolet is not a Man U supporter, they are a partner. Adidas is not a Man U member, they are a partner. We buy an iPhone, we are Apple's consumers. But Cisco, IBM, General Electric, who contribute in technological advancement to bring Apple to the the next level, they are Apple's partners. There may be members in a household, but in a marriage, they are only partners. Because partners are not mere supporters or consumers or members, partners are contributors. They are essential. Partners are essential to the vitality and purpose of an organization, a relationship, or even a school's group project. Even school children know the importance of having the right project group partners because a partnership cannot survive, much less thrive, without its partners doing their part. So friends, let me ask. If the church, if Mount Hermon is incorporated as a partnership, would it be your dream to make partner? Would the vision of furthering the kingdom of Christ with Hermon be a strong enough motivation to be a gospel partner? Would the reward of the heavenly presence of God outweigh any earthly sacrifice you are called to make for this partnership? Would the prize of knowing Christ fill you with eagerness and joy to walk the road of sacrifice towards gospel partnership? Friends, I hear the letter to the Philippians as a clarion call to gospel partnership. At the beginning of the letter, Paul thanks the Philippians for their partnership in the gospel. He then proceeds to spotlight examples of such worthy gospel partners in the persons of Timothy and Epaphroditus. He goes on to urge Eodia and Syndicate to be reconciled with one another. Why? Because they are fellow partners in the gospel. And he concludes the letter just as he began by thanking the church once again for their continued partnership in the gospel. The letter to the Philippians is a clarion call to gospel partnership. Paul is calling Christians to embrace their identity as his partners in gospel ministry. He's calling them to fulfill their responsibility as gospel partners. He's calling them to celebrate the joy of all that belongs to the gospel partner. It is no less, my friends, than what Christ himself commanded of those who bear his name. Follow me, Christ says, and I will make you fishes of men. 
the great fisher of man has made us co-fishers of man. The great shepherd of our souls has made me an under-shepherd of his flock. The Christ to whom all authority in heaven and on earth has been given has given us the authority to call the nations to follow him in discipleship. One can argue that the idea of church membership is merely implicit in the New Testament writings. But no one can deny that the idea of gospel partnership is the explicit calling of the New Testament Christian. None of us, this means, none of us is merely a member of the church. All of us are partners in the gospel. I repeat, none of us is merely a member of the church. All of us are partners in the gospel. This truth is seen in the opening verses of Philippians. I read, verse 1, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons. Paul makes it clear that he is not writing to a specific class of Christians. He is not merely addressing the leaders of the church at Philippi. He's not just talking to the clergy. He's speaking also to the laity. If anything, he's trying to communicate that he's writing to the ordinary Christian in the pew. And he adds on the overseers and the deacons to that group of ordinary Christians. To all the saints who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons. In other words, this call to gospel partnership is a general call to all believers. For the believer is a saint. And the saint is one who is wholly set apart. Set apart for what? Set apart from the trappings of the world, set apart for the will of God, set apart for the sake of the gospel. And it is no easy task being a gospel partner, which is why Paul books and his letter with grace. Verse 2, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. The opening verse, grace to you. The closing verse, grace with you. The call to gospel partnership is clear, and it is clearly difficult. But the call is embraced by grace. The call is encircled by grace. The work is undergirded by grace. Grace that it is sufficient for all our weaknesses, Grace that enables us to do all things in Christ who strengthens us. Grace that is enough. So, as we go through the letter, never lose sight of grace because grace never loses hold of us. The first thing we will learn about a gospel partner is his heart. We'll answer the question, what does the heart of a gospel partner look like? And from verses 3 to 8, we see three things that characterizes the heart of a gospel partner. And what we want to do is to compare these three characteristics with our own heart and see how they line up. And whenever lacking, wherever lacking, we strive then to develop the heart of a gospel partner. So, heart characteristic number one appreciation appreciation you want a heart that is appreciative of your fellow partners in the gospel you want a heart that appreciates your gospel partners verse 3 to 5 i thank my god i thank my god in all my remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine for you all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Paul thanks God each time he is reminded of the blessed reality that he has faithful partners in gospel ministry. Each time he is reminded of them, whenever he prays for them, his heart is filled with thankful joy. 
because gratitude and joy goes hand in hand. It is because you enjoy a gift. It is because you delight in a gift, which is why you are grateful for it and you give thanks for it. Thankfulness and joy naturally go hand in hand. Members of Herman, fellow partners of the gospel in Herman, do you delight in Herman? When Herman is brought to mind, when the church is brought up in conversation, whenever you remember her in prayer, does it bring you thankful joy to your heart? And the answer to that depends on whether or not you are appreciative of Herman. The extent of your joy is proportionate to the measure of your thankfulness for Herman. So tell me, do you give thanks to God for Herman? And if not, why not? Now you may say, well, Lewin, how do I put it? For starters, Lewin, we've got you as our pastor. Okay, fair point. But the assumption, of course, is that you deserve a better pastor than me. The assumption underlying this heart of ingratitude is that you are getting less than you actually deserve. So the reason why you might not be appreciative of Herman is because you believe you deserve a better church, a more vibrant church, a more loving church, a church that cares more, a church which is better at discipling, a church that does a better job at being church in general. So let me ask you the same questions I ask myself sometimes in my fight for joy in my heart. Here's the question. How do you know that Herman, with all her spots and flaws and wrinkles, isn't already more than you deserve? What have you done for Christ that has produced a situation where he now owes it to you to give you a better church? How certain are you that Mount Hermon isn't a revelation, isn't evidence of God's abounding grace towards you? How do you know that Mount Hermon isn't grace to you? Maybe the question, friends, isn't why am I not in a better church? Maybe the proper question to ask is why are you not in a worse church than the one you've got? Perhaps the answer is because of grace. Friends, a gospel-centered view of life would cultivate in us an ever-deepening sense of gratitude rather than a sense of entitlement. The gospel reminds us that the only thing we are entitled to is hell itself. That the very fact that you are in a church at all is only by His grace. You sinned and sinned and sinned, but then you were made a saint and was brought into a fellowship of saints together with his overseers and deacons. Now, should that not lead you to give thanks in all your remembrance of Mount Hermon? Should that not lead you to joyful thanksgiving every Sunday as you pray for her and worship with her? A gospel partner's heart is filled with appreciation for gospel partners. So tell me, when was the last time you thanked Mike Fong for leading the stewards? Or for Daniel Woon who manages the PA? Or for Mei Yi who prepares the communion elements? Or for Peter who moderates the BOE? Or for Darren and Darius who performs the worship songs? For the YGLs who care for your youths? For your CG leader who spends hours each week preparing for the Bible study he leads. These are your gospel partners. They play their part. Do you deeply and constantly give thanks to God for them? If, somewhere along the line, you have lost your sense of gratitude, which has robbed you of your joy in the body of Christ, behold the heart of the Apostle Paul. Learn from the heart of Paul and give thanks to God for the church. Now, if you think that the reason Paul is able to thank God in all his remembrance for the Philippian church 
is because there are such great saints in that church. Well, read on. Yes, they are excellent in some ways, but at the time of writing, the Philippian church is on the verge of splitting up because of a very public disagreement between two prominent members in the church. But in spite of the division and the tension within the church that Paul is painfully aware about, he nonetheless gives thanks to God in all his remembrance of them. Why? Because Paul is affirming of God's good work in the church. Paul is affirming of God's good work in the church. And this is heart characteristic number two. A gospel partner's heart affirms God's good work in his gospel partners. So friends, you want a heart that is appreciative of the church and you want a heart that is affirming of the church. Verse 6, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Paul is sure of this, that the Philippian church will keep progressing and maturing until they are perfected at the day of Jesus Christ. They are by no means the complete article. They are a work in progress, but Paul is confident that the work will progress. Why? What makes him so sure? What is the source of his confidence? What gives him this confidence is not the Philippians believers themselves. It is the God in whom the Philippians believe. His confidence in the church of Philippi is not founded on the church, but in the God who works in them. Now, what does this mean? It means that you may not see any reason for confidence in Hermon today by looking at Hermonites. But that's okay. That's not where your confidence is supposed to be found anyway. It's not a matter of whether Hermonites are willing and able. It's a matter of whether God is willing and able. And He is. We learned that as kids. He's able, He's able. I know my God is able to carry us through. You don't have to have faith in Hermonites. You ought, however, to have faith in the God who is able. You see, pessimism about the church is atheistic. Pessimism, my friends, is practical atheism. Because if you don't think that a church of God can be perfected, then that must mean that either God isn't real, or He isn't good, or He isn't able. None of which characterizes the God of the gospel. It is important, therefore, to have a gospel-centered ecclesiology, a gospel-centered view of the church. The gospel teaches us that we are justified by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And those whom he justifies, he glorifies. Which means that in the gospel, there is no room for pessimism about the state or the future of the church. There is only hope and optimism. The church justified will be the church sanctified. It will be the church glorified. He will do it. He who justifies will sanctify and will ultimately glorify the saints in him. In other words, the church is a work in progress and its progress is at work by the grace of God. The gospel partner knows this and his heart affirms this. Our joy for the gospel partnership that we have in Hermon is tied to our appreciation of Hermon, which in turn is tied to our affirmation of Hermon. So, are you affirming of the glorious future that awaits the church of Hermon? An affirmation obtained not by sight, but by faith. A faith that is assured of things hoped for and convicted of things not seen. Friends, are you convicted of Herman's ongoing sanctification? 
Are you certain of this? That a God who began a good work in our church will not abandon us, but will bring us to completion, to perfection on the day of Jesus Christ. Are you more complimentary or more critical about your gospel partners in Hermon? Are you more prone to praise or more tempted to disparage your fellow Hermonites? Are you quicker to point out the flaws of Hermon or identify the evidences of grace in the life of the church? It's easy, you know, to be critical about the church. If you find it difficult, I suggest you just get to know more people. Uh, get to know me. It's easy to be critical because you don't need faith in order to be critical. Although, my friends, it is critical that we have faith. If you find yourself struggling to affirm your gospel partners in Hermon, learn from Paul by fixing your eyes not on fallen men, but on the risen Christ, by setting your hope for them not on the ability of the people, but on the gracious work of God, by drawing confidence not in the present state of the church, but in the sudden promise of her future glory. There is no room for pessimism in the church so long as God is with us. And if God is with us, then he who began a good work in us will certainly bring it to completion at the day and for the glory of Christ Jesus. Are you sure of this as Paul is sure of it? Remember, Paul wasn't blind to the faults of the Philippian church. He sees their disunity. He sees their lack of humility. He sees their deep anxiety. He sees all of that, but he sees more than that. He sees also the God at work within them to will and to work for his good pleasure. Paul, with eyes of faith, does not see the Philippian church merely for what they are, he sees them for what they can be and what by God's grace they surely will be. And he faithfully affirms them. Will you, like Paul, affirm God's good work in your gospel partners in Hermon? I'm not asking you to be blind to our weaknesses. I'm asking you to behold the God who is with us and for us and in us the God who is able. He is the reason for your confidence and your affirmation of His church. Friends, it is important that our hearts are oriented towards affirmation because without it, there can be no appreciation. And without both affirmation and appreciation for your gospel partners in Hermon, there will not be the affection that finally characterizes the heart of the gospel partner. In addition to appreciation and affirmation, affection is our third and final heart characteristic of a gospel partner. Let us read our final verses. Verse 7, It is right for me to feel this way about you, because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. Notice what Paul says. Paul says that it is right and proper for him to be affirming of the Philippian church because he loves them and because they are his partners with him in suffering for the gospel, in defending the gospel, and in confirming the gospel. Gospel partnership, however, is not defined by human activity, not formed by human will. It is established by the grace of God. See how he describes it. They are all partakers with him of grace. The origin and basis of the gospel partnership is no less than the grace of God. 
And with the experience of God's grace, with the experience of God's amazing grace in your life and in your heart, comes joyful appreciation, comes optimistic affirmation, and comes heartfelt affection. Appreciation and affirmation for gospel partners graciously wells up in our hearts and spills over in affection for them. And what we see is that even this affection, this love for our gospel partners, is part of God's good work in us. The love we have comes from grace. For the affection we feel is the affection of Christ. Friends, when you put on gospel lenses through which you view the church, you will experience appreciation because you realize that what you have is more than you deserve. You will be led to grant affirmation for your church because the gospel is good news that God will save us and save us to the uttermost. And you will feel affection for the church because the gospel is the supreme revelation of love. For God so loved the church, He gave His Son for the church. For God the Son so loved the church, He gave His life for her. No saint in Christ, therefore, who are co-partakers with the church in the grace of the gospel, who are co-partners with the church for the sake of the gospel, will fail to experience a holy affection for the church produced by the gospel. Paul says to his gospel partners, I hold you in my heart. I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. As Jesus loves you, so do I. His affection for you fuels my affection for you. It is His love with which I am loving you. God is my witness. So we ask, does Jesus Christ love the church? Is He desirous of her? Is He affectionate towards her? The answer is a wholehearted yes. From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. With his own blood he bought her, and for her life he died. If Christ loves the church to death, then is it conceivable that any true believer who is in Christ and who Christ dwells within can fail to display deep and genuine affection for the church? Can anyone who professes to have Christ in his heart at the same time not hold the church in his heart as well? The answer is clearly no. The gospel partner loves his gospel partners because the grace that gave us the gospel is the grace that made us partners in the gospel and that same grace grants us the affection of Christ Jesus of the gospel. Paul therefore says that he yearns for them all. He longs for them all. He misses them. He desires to be physically reunited with them. Because that, my friends, is what affection does to us. It fills our hearts with yearning. And the reason he feels this way is because he is separated from them due to his imprisonment. He's under house arrest at this point, which is not a state of affairs, unfamiliar to most of us during this COVID period. We are in a state of de facto house arrest. The church has not been able to gather physically. CGs have not gathered physically for some months now. In this period of absence, do you yearn for the fellowship? Do you long once again to be gathered with your fellow partners in Herman? To break bread with them, to see them, to physically pray with them, to be with them not just in spirit but in person? Or has it been a case of out of sight and out of mind? Have you grown more uncomfortable each day with the physical absence of the wider church? Or have you grown more accustomed 
to a private style of worship? The answer boils down to affection. During Circuit Breaker, what we saw was that many employees were happy to work from home because they didn't like their colleagues very much. And they dread the day they have to return to the office to see their bosses face to face. At the same time, we saw many dating couples who moved in to the same house under one roof together because they could not contemplate the idea of remaining separated from the ones whom they love for any extended period of time. We don't ever have to tell people who are in love to yearn for their loved ones. We don't ever have to tell two people in love to long for their partner. They can't help but yearn for them. That's what love does. That's the natural effect that affection produces in our hearts. So this is a great opportunity to us. Do you miss the church? Do you long for her? Do you yearn for the fellowship during this extended time of absence from one another? The gospel partner feels a yearning for his partners in the gospel because the love he has for them is drawn from the well of affection that Christ Jesus himself has for the church. Again, to nurture this affection, to hold the church dearly in your heart, you have to first perceive the church through the lenses of the gospel. There in the gospel of grace, you will discover joyful appreciation for their partnership. There in the gospel, you will find confident affirmation for their growth in maturity. There in the gospel, you will experience heartfelt affection for the koinonia, for the fellowship of the gospel. Without appreciation, affirmation, and affection, friends, you cannot be, nor will you even want to be, a gospel partner of Mount Hermon. Without the heart of a gospel partner, you will not heed the call to gospel partnership. The old adage rings true, the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. Allow then the gospel to shape your mind and your heart for gospel partnership. Develop a heart through grace and prayer that is grateful for your fellow Hermonites, affirming for your progress in the faith and yearns to fellowship with them once again in the fullness of koinonia, of community and fellowship and partnership. It is the gospel that calls you into gospel koinonia. And it is worth, my friends, to heed that call. Because those who answer the call to gospel partnership belong to a fellowship deeper than any earthly relationship on the basis of our mutual participation in grace, in our mutual participation in the redemptive work of Christ announced by the glorious gospel of Christ. Friends, gospel partnership is the only partnership on earth that has the potential to build the kingdom of Christ and to shape the world for the glory of God. And the reward for faithful gospel partners is no less than the good news they themselves proclaim each day with their lives. The good news of knowing Christ and being found in Him from this day forth until forevermore. So friends, heed the glorious call to gospel partnership. Develop the heart of a gospel partner and lead you to become a gospel partner that is rewarded by the good news of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. But Lord, we thank you for calling us into your service. We thank you, Lord, that you have made us partners in the mission of the gospel here on earth. You have declared it, you have lived it, and now you call us to do the same. 
Lord, we pray that we may develop a heart of a gospel partner by your grace, being joyful in gratitude for our church, being confidently affirming of their progress, being wholeheartedly affectionate for the fellowship. We ask and pray that you continue your good work in us, that we might be the gospel partners you have called us to be for your kingdom here on earth and for your glory in Christ Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.